All right, greetings, young true believers. So today we're talking about Ernest Nagel on the logic of reduction. Um, reductionism is a very controversial doctrine in the philosophy of science. Uh, it's also very easily understood. So um, oftentimes commentators will use the Russian nesting doll analogy, right? Um, I'm sure you're probably familiar with the idea of Russian nesting dolls. You have a big doll and you open up the, you take off the head and there's a smaller doll inside and there's a smaller doll inside of the, the, the former one, et cetera, and on the way down. I like to use the layer cake metaphor myself. So if you think of a big uh, layer wedding cake, right? Typically, uh, the biggest layer on the bottom, the one that's holding up all the weight is physics. And then above that will be chemistry. Above that layer will be biology. Above that layer will be uh, you know, psychology and sociology. Above that will be history. And above that will be economics, right? I mean, and there are obviously little layers in between. But it's the, the ultimate idea is that all human knowledge will ultimately uh, be reduced someday to physics. And, and ideally, the one grand equation. Uh, which is known variously as the toe, the theory of everything, or the gut, the grand unification theory, right? Um, Nagel, for his part, is a big champion of reductionism, right? And reductionism was all the rage in the philosophy of science in the 1970s. It's somewhat fallen out of favor now, at least with philosophers of science. It's still really popular with scientists themselves. Um, but it's an important doctrine you need to know about. Um, and as Nagel points out, Reductionism has led to some advances in science. Uh, for example, the reduction of classical thermodynamics to statistical mechanics brought with it new insights in the nature of heat and entropy. Uh, and likewise, the reduction of optics to electromagnetic theory deepen our understanding of light and the behavior of light rays, right? So, um, again, it, it, it has been effective. Um, but reductionism runs into its problems, right? For example... Um, this is a bit far afield, but it, it illustrates some of the problems with reduction. Uh, Daniel Dennett points out that reductive explanations can't account for human free will, because if you go looking for, for evidence of human agency, free will, right, uh, on a subatomic level, you're not going to find any. You know, just this, The evidence simply isn't there. Where are you going to find it? Among the molecules, right? Um, instead, if you want to find evidence of human free will and agency, you have to go to the level of history and economics. And then you're going to find a great deal of evidence for it, right? Um, so the reductive explanations break down somewhat. Nevertheless, um, Nagel is a champion thereof, right? Um, and as is noted, right, um, we, we have to start with a few points about, about reduction generally. Um, the contrast between common sense and scientific descriptions of the natural world might recommend reductionism, right? So we should avoid approaching the issue of reduction in terms of a distinction between appearance and reality. And philosophers have traditionally liked to begin with a, a, a description of appearance and reality. Um, the editors of your text, as you might have noticed, uh, make the, a strong argument that the, that's just not a, a, a that approach isn't conducive to your understanding of what what is going on here, right? So um, the second point is, whatever its details, reduction properly so-called is typically construed as a relation or a family of relations between some reducing theory T prime and a reduced theory T. So, uh, and again, in this case, it would be classic thermodynamics would be the, the theory that gets reduced and um, uh, statistical mechanics is a the theory that's doing the reducing, right? So... Um, Nagel has uh, a few elements in mind when he's talking, when he's defending uh, uh, reduction, right? Uh, Nagel's talk of reduction, uh, reductive explanation suggests reducibility is commonly viewed as a kind of explanatory relation, whereby the reduced secondary science may be accounted for as a special case or branch of some more general or inclusive primary science, right? Um, obviously, when we, I think we talked about this earlier in the semester, uh, scientists like philosophers share a predilection for simplicity of explanation, right? This is again, uh, the famous Occam's razor principle of parsimony, do more with less. Um, 
and that usually means less high, fewer, fewer, and fewer hypotheses. So reductionism lends itself to that, hence part of its popularity, right? Um, on Nagel's account, a reduction is made when the fundamental claims of a secondary science or theory T are shown to be logical, logical consequences, mind you, right, of the fundamental claims of the primary reducing theory T prime. The conclusions of such arguments are said to be reduced statements, while the premises are called reducing statements, right? This, then, is the core idea in Nagel's treatment of intertheoretic reduction, that the reduced claims of the secondary the, uh, theory T be logically derivable from premises made up wholly of claims from the reducing primary theory T prime, right? So, <clears throat> um, it's important to note here, right, uh, the central feature, feature of Nagel's account of reduction, logical derivability, has two important consequences. First, the claims of T and T prime must be logically consistent. You can't have inconsistent premises between a reducing theory and a theory to be reduced. The, the reduction will just break down. It's, it, it won't hold, right? And secondly, any term shared by the reduced and reducing theory must have a common meaning if it if it appears in both the premises and the conclusions of reductive explanation. So, for example, suppose the two sets of laws, one set from the uh, from thermodynamics and the other from classical mechanics, both contain the terms volume and pressure. We could reduce thermodynamics to molecular mechanics using those laws only if only if volume and pressure had the same sense in both theories. If they do not, the supposed derivation would be invalid. So. Um, again, in short, right, uh, you've got to be able to derive the, uh, the principles of the, th of the theory that's being reduced from the theory that's, that's doing the reducing, right? Now, really quickly, a word about uh, Nagel's conception, his distinction, rather, homogeneous and inhomogeneous reduction, right? So, um, what homogeneous and in, inhomogeneous uh, re really boils down to is uh, distinguishing between the easy cases of reduction and the hard cases, right? In the easy cases, the descriptive or subject or subject matter terms of the reduced theory are either present in or can be explicitly defined by terms in the reducing theory. In the hard cases, some term or terms in the reduced theory are neither present in nor definable by other terms in reducing theory. The former cases are homogeneous uh, reductions, the latter inhomogeneous reductions, right? So bear that in mind as you're running through it. Um, you're gonna see uh, a lot of the philosophers in this chapter are gonna take issue with the notion of reduction, uh, most famously Paul Feyerabend. Uh, but know that this is an extremely important doctrine in the philosophy of science, extremely important, extremely controversial.